Good morning. My name is Dan Lindheim. I'm the faculty director of the Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement. The center was created by the class of 1968 around its 40th reunion. Some classes give benches, class 68 gave a center. The center's mission stems from a fundamental tenet that real political participation coupled with meaningful public debate is crucial for democracy. The center focuses on preparing leaders to engage people across the many divides to find solutions for pressing public policy issues. In our pursuit of productive and civil debate, we typically present panels involving people of disparate views. Um, to that end, in addition to inviting Stephen Hayward today, somebody in the Berkeley mainstream of solid conservative credentials, uh, we decided to demonstrate that Berkeley is open to people of all views and invited people of more progressive uh, leanings as well in the case of both Stephen Silverstein and Virtual Ross. So the first speaker is Steve Silverstein. Steve was originally a programmer in the UC Berkeley Library working on computerizing the card catalog. In 1978, he co-founded Innovative Interfaces, which develops automated library systems and now includes as customers more than 1,500 library systems around the world including the UC Berkeley, many UC campuses, California State University system, as well as many city and county library systems. Steve is a trustee of the UC Berkeley Foundation, is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Golden School for Public Policy. He also serves on the board of the Marin County Employees Retirement Association and on the board of National Public Vote, which we'll be talking about today. <coughs> Excuse me. He holds a BA in economics and a master in library science from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in econometrics from the University of Stockholm. Maybe most important, if you've ever been to the Free Speech Cafe, uh, you owe every debt of gratitude to Steve Stilberstein because he is responsible for it. Steve. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. One is uh, called National Popular Vote, which is a movement to reform the Electoral College, so whoever gets the most votes becomes president. And second, uh, about uh, something we now call voting at home. Uh, it used to be called absentee voting, then it's called vote by mail. And this is a, a movement to make it easier to vote by having the ballot mailed to you three weeks before the election so you can fill it out at home and mail it back. Most people in California are familiar with that because 70% of California voters uh, do that. And, uh, and it, it pretty soon will be 100%. It already is 100% in some counties. So uh, on the Electoral College, uh, to, change, to change it so that whoever gets the most votes wins, most people think you have to amend the Constitution or pass some kind of federal legislation. And that's not true. You don't need any change to the Constitution. You don't need any federal legislation whatsoever. Uh, the way it works is according to the Constitution, each individual state legislature has absolute total power to decide how that state's votes will be awarded in the Electoral College. Now, most states give all their state's votes to the person who won their state. But two states today do not do that. Uh, Nebraska and Maine have a kind of complicated system where they allocate uh, votes. Massachusetts has changed the way it allocates its electoral college votes 13 times in the over 200 years that they've been a state. So there's no doubt about this principle. So what we are doing is asking the state legislature of individual states to give all of the state's electoral votes to whoever got the most votes, not in the state, but in the country. And when a group of states agree to do that, the group having 270 electoral college votes, that is half the votes, when, they, when that group of states agrees to do that, it's done. So where are we in this? 
we've gotten 16 states to pass the law. Actually, the states among them, they enter into an interstate compact, a contract uh, with each other. These 16 states have entered into this contract saying we, as a group, are going to give all our votes to whoever got the most votes in the country as soon as a few more states do it so that we walk in with the block of 270 electoral college votes. Now, these 16 states have 196 electoral college votes, so we're 74 votes short. Uh, and we expect that we will be able to get the five or six more states that we need in the next couple of years. So everything goes according to plan. This is the very last election coming up where we'll have the election determined by these battleground states. You know, you all know this, that the whole election is fought in Ohio and Florida and maybe a couple of other states. If you vote for president in California, you're wasting your time because it doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is those battleground, uh, battleground states. Now, the consequence of the, of the uh, loser winning is the, the really bad thing about it is not that the loser wins. What's really bad about it is that the campaign and the president concentrate all their attention on those battleground states. So Florida gets whatever the hell it wants. Georgia, next door, gets nothing. Okay? Uh, Ohio gets everything it wants. Indiana, next door, gets nothing. So the amount of pork that the president hands out is 7% higher in these battleground states. And you see the whole issues that the campaign is fought about. You know, what are the issues, right? The issues are the issues that are relevant in those few battleground states. Uh, and of course, that isn't good for the country. So we are just spectators to whatever the heck goes on over there. The only way you can influence this is uh, move there. That would be a smart idea. In fact, that was suggested to me when I first got interested in politics. If you really want to be a player, move to Ohio. And I've been to Ohio. <laughs> I like Ohio. But I want to stay in California. Um, or you can take your hard-earned cash and give it to a, 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 you know, the party or a candidate, and they're going to spend all that money trying to convince one or two other people in Ohio, Florida, whichever the battleground state is, on what to do. And you can just sit here in California and watch or, uh, and so on. Uh, so where are we on this? Uh, so Democrats tend to be for this, and Republicans tend to be against it. Uh, this is, of course, some kind of memory of, of the, the Bush v. Uh, Gore 2000 campaign, where the Democrat won the popular vote and lost the Electoral College, or uh, the more recent one, where uh, Hillary won the popular vote and uh, uh, Trump got the, uh, got the election. Uh, but there are Republicans who are for it. So uh, it, has, it has passed the Oklahoma State Legislature, which is a Republican body and a Republican was well, that a time signal? Am I out of time, Larry? <laughs> uh, something I said here. So Republicans are Republican. There are some Republicans who are for it. Even Donald Trump said after he won that he preferred the national popular vote. He said, uh, of course, he if he had to do a, a, a campaign by the popular vote as opposed to the battleground states. He would, have, he would have won the popular vote. He would have campaigned differently. And that's exactly the point. Uh, he would have campaigned differently. The issues would have been entirely, entirely different. Uh, so that's where we are on that. Uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions about it later on. So the, what that does is makes your vote count across the country. Uh, so because right now, as I said, in the presidential election, the only votes that count are the votes in the battleground and in the few battleground states. The next thing is, what can we do to make voting easier for people? And in here in California, we're used to these voting by mail. Uh, we get our ballots delivered to us. We fill them out at our leisure uh, around the kitchen table. Uh, and so on. most states don't have that kind of system. There are six states that do. 
But there's a lot of uh, states where in order to get an absentee ballot, uh, you have to have a letter from your doctor, uh, or you have to be pregnant, uh, or uh, all kinds of complicated excuses, and it's practically impossible to do. So this disenfranchises lots and lots of people. So what we're trying to do with the vote at home movement is change the laws in these other states so that it's easier for people to get what they call an absentee ballot so that they can, they can vote at home. When this happens, the turnout goes up. It goes up in the presidential elections and it goes really up in the non-presidential elections. It goes up among young people, okay? The old folks like myself who are retired and got nothing else to do, we can, we can take the day and sit around in the polls and schmooze and, and so on, but most young people have a job to go to and kids to take care of. And also where it really increases the turnout is in the down ballot races. So most people, when they go to the polls and you know you, the ballot is like this long, uh, who knows, most people know who the president is and, and the, the, you know, the issues in that campaign. But a lot of people don't know who their state legislator is, who their congressperson is, who their school board person is, and so on. So they don't vote on these down ballot races. So that's part of the reason that we have a, you might say, a distorted, uh, a distorted government. When they vote at home, they vote generally for the, the, the entire ballot. When they don't know who the people are, they can, maybe they got some mailer or something like that. They can look at their picture or they can go on the internet or whatever and figure it out. So it's a really a big improvement. Uh, and uh, if you got any spare time, you can help. Oh, I got five more minutes left. Uh, all right, well, I'll, I think that's enough for now, okay. Thank you, Steve. I was really glad you made that last comment about the down ballot because certainly we don't want people not to vote in California here. <laughs> Virgil Ross is the Chancellor's Professor of Law at Berkeley Law where he teaches courses on legislation, election law, and constitutional law. He, reserved, he received his JD from Yale Law School and has a master's in the politics of world economy from LSE from London School of Economics. He also has a master's in public affairs from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and a BA in International Affairs and History from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He clerked in the Middle District of Alabama and on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. He's written extensively on a wide variety of legal issues and most recently has published on the topics of partisan gerrymandering, inequality and political participation, and increasing the political participation of the poor. Virgil. It's great to be here. How are you guys doing? Good morning. I would say that I would take up five, um, Steve's extra five minutes, but I read an article in the Chronicle saying the winds are about to return, and I'm worried that PG&E might shut us out. So <laughs> I'll try to keep my comments brief before the power goes out and to give um, everyone a chance to speak. So um, I'm at the law school, and my main focal point um, in terms of thinking about law of democracy issues is on participatory inequality. And my focus on participatory inequality is on class-based participatory inequality. Now, um, over the last 40 years since the United States Census started keeping records, there has been a consistent 30% to 35% um, voter turnout gap between the richest 20% of individuals in the United States and the poorest 20% of individuals in the United States on the basis of income. Now, that's kind of the problem I want to, I want to suggest that that's a problem. Now, if you think about it historically, we might not think about it as a problem. Um, if you look to sort of what the framers and, um, were doing in constructing the Constitution and setting up a Republican system of government, part of the goal was to ensure that only the most virtuous and the most independent are able to vote. And they deemed those without property to not have sufficient independence um, to perform their duty of voting um, in a way that would um, advance the Republican goals of this country. And so the idea was that there would be representatives who would be even of the more virtuous elite, the elite property holders in our country, um, who would hold office, 
and those maybe of the less virtuous variety who were also property holders would elect them, and those that just didn't meet the standard of virtue and that they did not hold property would be excluded from our populace, or our, our pop polity, not our populace, they'll still be here, but they won't be able to vote. Now, we've evolved in our understanding of sort of the notion of independence and dependence. We've also evolved in our understanding of the role of representatives. Um, a late 20th century innovation has been the idea that our democracy should be inclusive um, from a participatory perspective. And that has led to movements to extend the voting rights to African Americans and other racial minorities through the Voting Rights Act. Um, and um, to, uh, to extend sort of the opportunities to participate in governance for women um, through the true implementation of the um, 19th Amendment. But our attention has not been really focused that much on the poor. The poor, we all recognize, should have the right to vote, um, should be perhaps uh, a part of our polity, but we never really think about sort of the marginalization, or we don't think enough about the marginalization and alienation of the poor from our politics as best reflected in the fact that there is a huge gap in participation between the richest 20% and the poorest 20%. So when we think about sort of this gap and we think about the lack of participation of the poor, um, our minds might immediately turn to active forms of voter suppression. We might think of voter ID laws, which um, impose a cost on voters, um, individuals that want to vote. Um, even if you make voter IDs free, you still have to obtain the birth certificate and necessary documentation to obtain a voter ID. And you have to make the effort or spend the time to go to whatever um, DMV or whatever um, agency to obtain that voter ID. We've also focused on registration barriers that have been set up um, with respect to voting, um, states that require you to register well in advance of elections. Um, we've also looked at voter roll purges, and voter roll purges apply to individuals that uh, perhaps haven't voted in prior elections, that the state uses that fact that they haven't voted to purge them for the voter rolls, and therefore require that they re-register. And our focus on this is, I think, appropriate. Right? Um, active forms of voter suppression, things that make it harder to vote, do diminish the likelihood that individuals will vote. And they do have an impact in terms of perhaps the most competitive races, um, given that um, those who are, uh, who are deprived of the opportunity to vote may um, shift the election outcome in these closely competitive races. But I would argue that if we're really concerned about the um, participatory deficit and this huge gap, focusing on these active forms of voter suppression are not enough. These active forms of voter suppression, again, operate on the margins, but if we really want to get at the gap, we need to think about why people vote and why people don't vote, and maybe attacking the problem from a more diverse, pluralistic perspective. So thinking about why people vote and why people don't vote, we have um, rational choice theory. Anthony Downs, back in the 1950s, writing about the economic theory of democracy. And what he did was to uh, offer a equation or a, or a calculation as to uh, a calculus um, that predicts um, voting. And what his calculus is pretty simple, right? There's multiple parts, but I'll keep it simple. If the cost to voting exceeds the benefits from voting, people won't vote, right? Simple cost-benefit calculus includes other parts, but I don't think those other parts are particularly relevant for the conversation right now. Now, we talk a lot about the cost, and we think about active forms of voter suppression as one of the costs. But what we often miss in this equation are the benefits from voting, right? If people do not perceive that there is a benefit from voting, you could lower the cost to essentially zero and they still will not vote. So where do these benefits come from? Well, the benefits come from a, uh, uh, the um, opportunity to see a difference between the candidates in, in terms of affecting a person's well-being. If the person that's trying to vote or, or is thinking about voting does not perceive that either of the candidates will make any notable difference in their lives, um, then why vote for either candidate? If they don't feel that they have a stake in the election because neither candidate, neither party is paying attention to their needs, why vote? And often, even if there are candidates that are attentive to their needs, they may not have the information to make that assessment as to which candidates might be attentive to their needs. So Anthony Downs in his rational choice theory of voting paid a lot of attention to sort of this differential between the candidates in terms of policy platforms and how they might impact individuals differently. He also paid attention, a lot of attention to the role of information and the availability of information to individuals to be able to make that assessment as to which candidates might better advance their interests. 
Now, I'm not saying that there's no difference between the parties in terms of their attention to lower income individuals. I would posit to say that the, poor, uh, that the Democratic Party, at least from a lip service campaign platform perspective, are more responsive to the poor. I will sort of push back on the idea from a policy perspective that they always follow through on their campaign lip service. And I think that the Republicans have, at least over the last 30 years, been less attentive um, to the interests of the poor, at least from their economic interest perspective. We could talk about cultural interest perspective um, during the Q&A. But ultimately, the, the, the fact that there hasn't been as much follow through in the policy perspective, and there's also not as much sort of engagement with candidates in campaigns with the poor has diminished the effectiveness of this difference on the incentives for the poor to vote. So how do individuals derive information about candidates in particular elections? Well, you might sort of focus on TV ads, right? And that's kind of been the primary avenue of delivery of information over the last, um, since the advent of the TV age. The advent of TV age and the shift to radio and television ad in, in particular shifted campaign resources away from what was the traditional form of campaigning, getting boots on the ground, knocking on people's door, talking to people, to this kind of more generalized sort of blast the TV ad for 30 seconds into an individual's living room and hope that that convinces them and persuades them to vote by providing them with enough information to make that voting decision. But what we know from um, social science articles and empirical studies is that campaign ads are almost entirely ineffective. They do not provide the tailored information that individuals need to make a decision about whether this candidate or one of the candidates will be attentive to their needs. Instead, what's been found is that what individuals often need is a more tailored form of information, information that is more responsive to the situation and circumstances of the individual and, um, and allows for sort of an engagement with the individual on those terms. And the primary vehicle for this more tailored information has been mobilization, canvassing. So when, when campaigns get their boots on the ground, engage people um, door to door, that has been shown to have a, a, an important effect on providing information, people with information and encouraging them to vote. What I'll tell you right now is that uh, uh, the canvassing and door-to-door -door canvassing, according to studies by um, Alan Gerber and Don Green and others that followed them, has had a much more positive effect on turnout than any negative effect from voter ID laws or any form of voter suppression. The difference in effect is actually quite large. And yet we don't pay attention to what might be sort of this distortionary effects of campaign mobilization activities. So just as individuals make a calculus as to whether they want to vote, campaigns make a calculus as to who they want to contact. And their calculus is based on who would be, who, who, who would my contact more likely impact in terms of their voting behavior? And who would my contact likely more impact in their decision to vote for me? So what do they do? They make a calculus based on a couple of things. They make a calculus based on whether this individual has voted in the past, right? And, and they make a calculus on the basis of a variety of different sorts of information about whether, whether this, that, that serve as predictions as to whether that individual is gonna vote for me in this particular election. They could be partisan affiliation, they could be sort of other sort of data about their their um, subscription um, behavior, about their television viewing behavior, and other factors that gives the campaign some prediction about whether that individual might vote for them. So in this calculus of contact, the most important factor, I would suggest, is the fact whether they voted in the past elections. Because campaigns have made the determination that it's much less costly to mobilize those individuals who have voted in past elections because they're more likely to vote in the current election with just a little bit of a nudge, with less of a nudge than those who have, haven't voted in prior elections. As a result, along with this disparity that I talked about at the beginning between the rich and poor in terms of voting behavior, there has been a disparity in terms of political parties and who they contact. And this disparity in the gap and this mobilization, mobilization gap is um, only slightly small, smaller than the participation gap. There's a generally a 15 to 20% mobilization gap between, the, between um, the rich and the poor in terms of political parties are more likely to um, mobilize and contact the rich at a level of 20% greater than they are the poor. And so if you think about sort of this correlation, right? Causation, correlation is not causation, of course, but an interesting correlation and, and combine it with studies that show the effectiveness of mobilization on getting people to turn out, we see sort of a major source of the problem, 
a part of the problem that's long been ignored. And what I would say in terms of innovating democracy is to refocus our attention on this mobilization gap. How do we incentivize political parties to engage the poor more, right? And that's part of the challenge is um, political parties, in terms of calculus of contact, they may sort of have this democ democratic inclusive ideas behind them, but they may not sort of want to prioritize democratic inclusion at the expense of their opportunity to win elections. And as a result, you kind of have to sort of think about carrots, maybe sticks, as a way to incentivize the parties to mobilize the poor more. And, if, and some of those carrots might be, as we have in the presidential campaign um, context, in which we used to provide matching funds, or we still do, but no sane candidate would take the matching funds, but we used to provide matching funds to candidates if they opted into this presidential funding system that was operated by the federal government. We could think about rejiggering um, that and reorienting that towards a mobilization matching fund in the sense that those campaigns who engage in mobilization activities that are targeted towards communities that typically do not participate will receive extra funding or a match of their mobilization funding from the federal government for that mobilization activity. You could also imagine vouchers playing a role. To the extent that you give everyone vouchers, or maybe to the extent that you discriminate and only give low-income people vouchers, and these are um, things that individuals can give to candidates or parties in the form of vouchers that the state or local government gives that are represent a, a value of money. Um, so think about the Seattle vouchers, in which individuals are provided with $50 or $100 um, to give to a campaign of their choice. You could think about sort of extending that voucher system as a, a, as a way to incentivize parties to contact individuals. Because if parties stand to benefit not only from vouchers, from a vote, but potentially from money, for, from money in the form of vouchers, it might provide the, 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 enough of the impetus to engage um, these particular low income voters. Another third idea, and I'll conclude on this point, is well, maybe campaigns shouldn't have access to the information that they have access to. So the most important sort of factor that I just described in terms of mobile campaign mobilization decisions is the voting behavior of individuals, whether, they, and whether and how often they voted in past elections. Only states keep that information. And states can, if they wanted to, withhold that information. And if states withheld that information, one question would be whether that would change um, campaigns mobilization behavior. And one of the things that we're trying to test is whether states that do withhold that information have different sort of campaign mobilization behavior than those states that share that information. And to the extent that the information, the sharing of information could have an effect on mobilization activities, then maybe that could be another response to this mobilization gap. I'll end that there and thank you for having me. Thank you. I think, I think Tony Downs is still alive. Professor Ross, um, we actually have a, had a student who we financed a couple years ago who worked on the Seattle-related voucher project. Um, he didn't convince me back when he was doing the project, but maybe the reality is uh, a lot better. Our next speaker is uh, Stephen Hayward. He's a visiting professor at the Golden School of Public Policy and senior resident scholar at IGS, the Institute for Go Government Studies. He was previously the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Visiting Professor at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy and the inaugural Visiting Scholar in Conservative Thought and Policy at University of Colorado, Boulder. I guess we have two Boulder contacts here. So go Buffs, I guess, but go Bears. <laughs> From 2002 to 2012, he was a fellow in law and economics at the American Enterprise Institute and has been a senior fellow at the Pacific Research Institute in San Francisco since 1991. He writes frequently for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, National Review, Washington Examiner, and the Claremont Review of Books and other publications. He's the author of six books and he writes daily on powerlineblog.com which I'm told is a leading conservative political website to my enduring ignorance. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. 
Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for coming out in the teeth of a imminent football game. I'm really impressed and delighted. Uh, I'm also delighted that uh, this allows me to share that one of the biggest perks of being a conservative unicorn at Berkeley, or as I tell my friends back east, an inmate at Berkeley, <laughs> uh, is that you get to be president of the Berkeley City Republican Club. <laughs> and you also get to be the member. <laughs> I've, I've been looking for a phone booth to have a meeting with myself in. We don't have them anymore, right? It's, um, <laughs> so what I want to do is uh, uh, frame a couple of issues in a somewhat roundabout way, both the title of this panel, Innovating Democracy, Key Issues for 2020 and Beyond, and then also the general umbrella of the Center for Civility and Engagement. I want to frame it with uh, my two essential laws of paranoia. Uh, my first law of, uh, I call it my first law, is the, of, uh, the law of insufficient paranoia, uh, which runs that no matter how bad things look on the surface, it's invariably the case that when you look closer, you find out that things are even worse than you thought. And I think this is true of academia, although not for the reason you might expect from someone like me. When I say worse than you thought, I don't mean the standard conservative complaint that universities are deeply leftist. They've been on the left for decades. This is not news. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think that Berkeley, my perception of having spent some, a bit of time here now, is actually less dogmatically and ideologically left than a great many private liberal arts colleges, I can point out. Uh, it, you know, there's the whole historic reputation of Berkeley that you can never live down, and you know, that's just life. Um, well, the problem I have in mind behind my insufficient paranoia comment is best analyzed actually by one of the most prominent and, to my mind, formidable center-left thinkers of our time, and that's Cass Sunstein of Harvard Law School, who served in an important senior position for President Obama. Uh, I commend to your attention his article and also a chapter in his recent book, Conformity, The Power of Social Influences, and if you know Cass Sunstein, I'm sure Bertrand is familiar with him, Cass Sunstein never publishes an article that you couldn't publish in 15 different versions. That's his special superpower, right? It's amazing. Uh, anyway, the, the title of the original article was called The Law of Group Polarization. And, the, and you can look it up. There's uh, free versions available online. The Law of Group Polarization. And he wasn't concerned as much with the usual concept of groupthink. He's about something worse. He explores in this article how homogeneous groups of people become more extreme the more they hang out together and deliberate together. And he wrote his paper because he thought this uh, phenomenon was understudied. So I'll quote him here. Members of a deliberating group move toward a more extreme point of view in whatever direction is indicated by the member's pre-deliberation strategy, close quote. In other words, it's not at all to be surprised in my mind that a homogeneous group of academics uh, concerned with uh, whatever problem, whether you're racism, voting, uh, foreign whatever p issue you want to pick, uh, deliberating and talking to each other in isolation become more extreme in their outlook and finally begin offering categorical generalizations that explain too much. So one of the implications Sunstein argued, and I'll quote him again here, is that social homogeneity can be quite damaging to good deliberation. When people are hearing echoes of their own voices, the consequence may be far more than support and reinforcement. Particular forms of homogeneity can be breeding grounds for unjustified extremism even fanaticism. This leads, he goes on to what he calls social cascades. The serious risk with social cascades is that they lead to widespread errors, factual or otherwise. The social process is polluted by the dominance of conformity. I like that phrase quite a lot. If you swap out academic process and academic homogeneity for social process, I think you have an accurate description of the defect, I'll start here, for liberals of not having enough challenges, serious challenges to their views and disposition. Um, so, you know, the decline of conservatives in the social sciences and humanities and uh, universities going back 25 years now is well documented. Uh, and I think, as I just suggested, I think this is a disaster for the left, just as I think it is a disaster for the right that too many people only get their news from Fox News. I think these are reciprocal kinds of problems, all the different contexts. One's academic, one's media. Uh, but I'll give you an example just from my own experience. I have a rule about Twitter. I only argue with people I know and that I like, because it's such a sewer. 
I don't know why we call it social media when it's such so obviously antisocial in its effects. In any case, there's two faculty members here, both very far on the left, both very smart, and we'll have Twitter arguments, although we tend to shut them down very fast before third parties come in and drag it down in the sewer. And I've had one recently with one of them, actually this fellow's left the faculty, but we're still uh, uh, encountering each other, keep up on Twitter, and we're having an argument about something, and we're starting to go back and forth, and he says, well, this proposition. I say, yeah, that's correct. And this proposition, yeah, that's correct too. And this proposition, yes, you're right about that. And then his next question was, well, then we agree, don't we? And I said, no, actually, we don't. <laughs> he says, why not? And then in 200 characters, because that's Twitter, I say, this is why. And his next response, I fully expected, I've never heard such a thing before. And I said, yes, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, to be continued, and we are continuing it offline, as they say. My second law of paranoia concerns what I call the asymmet uh, asymmetrical paranoia. And this will draw us into our particular issues which have begun to be introduced here. Uh, and asymmetrical paranoia in colloquial speech means each side assumes that the other side is 10 feet tall, or to put it a little more sharply, each side thinks the other side is especially evil and perfidious. And so, for example, Donald Trump thinks that there were 5 million illegal or ineligible votes cast against him in the 2016 election. There's no serious evidence for this proposition, beyond a couple of very small anomalies and irregularities that always occur in American elections with more than 200,000 voting precincts, all of them locally governed and run by, largely by volunteers. And actually, maybe this is a place to uh, drop in a thought, which I wasn't quite sure where to put it. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever volunteered to work a precinct, if some of you have. Yeah, you, you're sort of civic-minded people. Uh, I've observed a few, and I've actually observed uh, you know, the meetings at registrars of voters uh, you know, three or four days before the election, where you get the volunteers in, and you know, here's the ballot, here's the new procedures, here's you know, all the things, the changes since the last election. And an awful lot of these volunteers are people who are enthusiastic because it's their way of participating in the civic process. They're not necessarily ideological, not paid, um, and it's one of the glories of our system. Now, I can go on a long time why I think this is true. That will end with a, if we go to a more predominant national popular vote system. It won't end right away. It'll take 10 or 20 years, but there will be persistent demands that both parties in Washington will want to centralize, standardize, and ultimately professionalize our election day process to ensure the integrity of, of a, a system that now emphasizes the popular vote. That may be a perfectly acceptable trade-off, but it is a trade-off. And one of my grumps about reform or innovation is that we don't acknowledge trade-offs. And I think it would be very sad myself, but, but then we should not be surprised if we wake up 10 years from now after changing the system and wonder why public enthusiasm, public support, and confidence in our political culture has dropped by another five points. As I say, the trade-offs may end up being positive when you add them up, but let's be clear about they exist. Uh, conversely, I think the claims of vote suppression popular with the left are similarly exaggerated or overestimated. Uh, not wrong, uh, it varies from state to state and place to place. But there have been a lot of criticisms about specific claims about Wisconsin in the last election, for example including from very liberal academics uh, like uh, Rick Hasen at UC Irvine, who I never agree with about anything. I know Rick, so I'm right. Or Etienne Hirsch of Tufts. I do point to one macro level thing, and this gets back to something Bertrand was saying. Donald Trump almost won Minnesota. It's been almost 50 years since a Republican won Minnesota. It was Richard Nixon's 49 state sweep in 1972. Why was Trump there 10 days ago? They think Minnesota's in play, and you mentioned canvassing. The Trump operation is heavily canvassing Minnesota right now, doing exactly what you're saying. They think they're gonna flip that state. By the way, I mean, about Minnesota, they're very proud of the fact, well, I'll put it this way, I've been invited a few times to the Hubert Humphrey Institute at the University of Minnesota, and I always like to have fun saying, what's wrong with you people? You're the only state that never voted for Ronald Reagan even once, which always gets huge cheers from the audience. So Minnesota nice, right? Um, a more interesting problem, I'm gonna end with this here, I think, is uh, what I'm calling uh, uh, voter self-suppression. I don't mean that literally, but I'll come back to that for a minute. Uh, one quick comment on gerrymandering before going on. I'm old enough to remember Phil Burton, the great congressman from across the bay in 1981, boasting of his house map 
uh, calling it his contribution to modern art for all the bizarre shapes that he made, which was widely thought to have given uh, Democrats five additional House seats in California beyond their intrinsic two-party vote split here in California. Uh, and uh, my point, and Republicans hated this. They went to court, they lost, they ran two ballot initiatives that failed. Uh, and uh, the, my point is, is that uh, I'm not much impressed with complaints about gerrymandering uh, since it became a crisis of democracy only when Republicans got good at it. I'm, by the way, I'm in favor of having a computer do it, and I can tell you why and how if we go on. Um, now, being a right-wing extremist, I'm against innovation, a title that <laughs> is not literally true. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, you know, this, what I just said a moment ago about you know, the volunteers and our selection process and avoiding trade-offs. There's the, uh, I'm sure uh, 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 Mr. Silverstein knows the Make Every Vote Count Foundation. They're probably allies of yours. Uh, their description is uh, they want to persuade Americans about the merits of reforming the presidential selection system in two ways. To encourage all major party nominees to campaign everywhere, causing more voters to be engaged in the election, and to guarantee that the winner of the national popular vote always wins a majority of the Electoral College and then becomes president. The, we've heard the case for the second part, it's cogent and serious, uh, but if we have that system, major party nominees will not campaign everywhere. They're gonna direct their resources to where the largest number of votes are. That will be good for California, a lot more campaign spending here. It will, as a first pass, double the cost of presidential campaigns. We worry about money in politics. Hillary Clinton's campaign spent a billion dollars, uh, only to be upended by $100,000 in Facebook ads by Russians, apparently. Um, and my first pass is you can double that figure because you're going to want to do extensive can canvassing. This is the most in California, in New York. Uh, and both parties will try and run up their vote totals where the most number of voters are. And having been in Ohio in 2012 in October, I can tell you, you know, it, it, one of the blessings of living in California right now is we're not barraged with as many of the political presidential ads as a battleground state. Oh my, it's just ridiculous. Um, anyway, um, now I might feel better about innovation if, uh, how am I doing here? Uh, okay, I'll get through this. I might be more enthusiastic about it if we spent more time looking at how past reforms had gone wrong or past innovations. I'll give you my first example is, if you go back to the political science literature in the late 1950s, early 1960s, broad consensus about the problem with our parties is they're too heterogeneous. By the way, Tom Hayden made the same complaint in the Port Huron statement. You've got liberal Republicans, you've got conservative Democrats in the South, you've got always people in the middle who are indistinct and it, it makes sort of clarity and ideological coherence impossible to get in our politics. Uh, that lasted a long time. I point out in one of my books on President Reagan that when he took office in 81 with the first Senate Republican majority in 26 years, there were 16 liberal Republican senators in the Republican caucus. People like Mark Hatfield, Mac Mathias, Chuck Percy, and my favorite Lowell Weicker of Connecticut, who Reagan in his diary referred to as a no good pompous fathead. That nice guy, right? right. Uh, today, there's like maybe one, you know, Susan Collins, a little bit of the time, not really. In other words, we now have homogeneous political parties. And what do political scientists now today say of this? It's terrible. This is horrible. I wish we had those old heterogeneous political parties back. My point being is maybe we political scientists aren't such geniuses in reforms and changes, notwithstanding the anomalies we observe. Uh, second one is President Trump himself. I do not believe Trump could have won the nomination under the pre-1972 rules of presidential selection. That's possibly true of Ronald Reagan in 1980. I think that's not true of Obama. I think he would have thrived and been selected by the party under the old rules. A lot of reasons why we did it. Democrats were upset that Hubert Humphrey got the nomination without entering a single primary in 1968, and Republicans followed along saying, let's have primaries. I think campaign finance reform has also weakened political parties such that there is no party establishment anymore in either party. Let me just talk about how the party helped Hillary Clinton against Bernie in 2016. I think that's very much small ball. Uh, I will say that I was still, up to the moment that Donald Trump walked out on the stage with that great backlit scene, back, backlit scene of the convention in Cleveland, thinking to myself, surely Bob Dole is gonna show up at any moment with a great big hook and put an end to this. 
But no, there isn't a party establishment anymore, so that's not possible. And so this is, you know, Donald Trump is a fruit of reform in some respect. Uh, real quickly, I see I have 20 seconds left on my clock. Uh, I may come back to this. Um, I mentioned vote self-suppression. I'm much taken with the fact that the um, turnout in municipal elections around the country, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, it's now down about 20%. People aren't turning, and that represents, in my mind, a collapse of civic political culture that has nothing to do with any vote. There's no voter suppression taking place in Los Angeles or Philadelphia or New York. And it's just within the last 20 years, you'd see 55% turnouts in New York and a lot of these cities. Now, some of this may be the collapse of any effective Republican opposition in these towns. I don't think that's the whole story. I think it does get back to some of the things Bertrand said about information, and I'm a mutual fan of Tony Downs. Um, but, and that opens up to some wider, I think, deeper issues than just ballot access and absentee ballot, most of which I'm sort of sympathetic to. Anyway, thank you very much for indulging me an extra 30 seconds. So since Steve went last and took a few, made a few comments about prior presenters, I wanted to give you an opportunity to add anything you'd like or let anybody say anything to any of the other panelists at this point before we go into more pointed kind of questions. Do either of you want to engage with anybody? You don't have to go after Steve. You well, can. Uh, <laughs> So I'll make a, a wild uh, suggestion to uh, appeal uh, to uh, poorer people to vote. Uh, two presidential candidates have talked about uh, handing out a check of $500 a month, one Kamala, $500 a month to every person in the country, and Andrew Yang, $1,000. Uh, I would say if you handed out those checks to those people who voted, you'd have pretty damn close to 100% participation. You know, so the, the tax code uh, could be modified uh, to give a tax credit, a refundable tax credit for people who vote. You get a tax credit for donating to charity, uh, for drilling for oil, for putting solar on your roof. Why not get a, a tax credit uh, a refundable tax credit for, for voting. And that would motivate uh, people and it would show that voting uh, does pay. Yeah, I, I'm. <laughs> I guess people, I like, people I, like receiving money. Yeah, no, I'm entirely sympathetic to that. Um, you know, but I'll just kind of sort of share a caveat. Um, we do have, you know, a system of not necessarily encouraging people to vote, but requiring people to vote in other countries, right? Compulsory voting, um, in which it's not a carrot in terms of you get money for voting, it's a stick, you get fined for not voting, right? And yes, that has increased turnout, has diminished the gap. The challenge and the problem has been that what we see in these compulsory voting states is a lot of random voting. People aren't voting based on any sense of who the candidates are, they're voting because they don't wanna get fined. And therefore, they're not sort of gaining the information necessary to make informed choices. So I think providing a carrot to incentivize people to vote could be part of the solution for sure. But I think there has to be something coming on the other side that gives people the information to be able to make informed choices in their voting behavior. I don't just want turnout at 100% as a sort of end all be all. I want sort of informed turnout at as high a level as we can get as, as the goal of our democracy. I, I think uh, paying people votes would guarantee a 110% turnout. <laughs> it's my hunch, just a, just a hunch on this. But I'll say, I'll say more broadly though, since you, you started off, uh, Steve, with uh, the universal basic income idea, this is interesting because this is one area where there is some crossover between left and right on, on that idea, which may owe its origin to Milton Friedman in 1959, who called it for what we call the negative income tax, right? And that got renamed over the years, guaranteed annual income. Now we're calling it universal basic income. So strange bedfellows on this. Uh, you say $1,000 a month, I think, is that Yang, right? 
so, you know, the hated Charles Murray wrote a book in 2007 where he advocated for a universal basic income of $40,000 a year per person. He did a lot of math on this. Most people don't know this book exists. Uh, and, you know, we went through a lot of math on it, and, you know, it'd be taxed away once your income rises, so you and I would pay, we'd get nothing. Okay. Uh, he'd also added to it, this is 2007, remember, he added to it a requirement that everybody must buy health insurance out of it, a universal mandate. Isn't this get interesting? So there's people on the right who support the idea in a pretty serious way. And then on the sort of the center, Bill Galston, you know, was an advisor to Clinton, is at the Brookings Institution. I had him out here last year to talk, and he was asked about this. He said, I'm against the universal basic income. So this is interesting and curious that the, the usual rigid divisions are not there on this issue. And we've had a, several runs at this, you know, with most famously under Nixon, with the Family Assistance Plan and a few others. And I could kind of see that maybe this might happen down the road. So I had I, so I, let's start with a couple of just more direct questions, and before we open it to the audience, um, first, Steve, is is there? This is presumably the national public vote is coming in popular vote. What did I say? Public national popular vote is coming following the Trump election. Is there, from a democratic point of view, a sort of counterintuitive or counterproductive argument that could come out of this? I mean, it seems to make sense at this moment, but is this sort of clever by half potentially moving forward? So in reality, there's, there's no real way to determine whether a national popular vote favors Democrats or Republicans. What we know is that the campaigns uh, would come out, would be run differently. Uh, so just because the last two times, and it's happened five times in our history, the Democrats, you might say, lost and the Republicans won, uh, it could be, and many Republicans believe, that a national popular vote would benefit Republicans. I point to the uh, 2004 election. This was the re-election of George W. Bush against uh, John Kerry. Now, Bush won the popular vote by three million. That is the same margin that Hillary won it last time. He came within 50,000 votes of losing Ohio. And in fact, election night, they thought, the Bush campaign thought they were gonna lose Ohio. And they actually had a speech prepared to say to heck with the electoral uh, the Electoral College, because it would have lost the president. They did all kinds of, of voter suppression in Ohio. If you remember the newspaper stories, it was a, a night with a lot, election day, it was a very heavy rain. Uh, there were not enough uh, voting machines in uh, poor and uh, districts, African-American districts. Uh, the lines were, you know, were like eight or nine hours long, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so there was a case uh, where the Republican won the popular vote, came so close, e even with all the suppression that they engaged in, uh, to losing Ohio and losing the, losing the presidency. So it cuts, both, it cuts both ways. And then I just had a second sort of detailed question. What happens, since this is all predicated on state legislatures approving the proposal, and then you have this compact when you get to 270 votes. What happens if a state legislature changes its mind subsequently? Yeah, so this is an interstate compact or, or contract. So and like every contract, it has a provision for withdrawing. So you can withdraw from the contract, but you have to do it six months before the election. So you have to withdraw in June uh, you know, for the November election. Uh, so, of course, in June, no one knows how the election's going to turn out. We don't even, might not even know who the nominees, uh, who the nominees are. Uh, so uh, there is an orderly provision, but it can't be done, you know, two days before the election or, or two days after, uh, after the election. Uh, in reality, of, of course, uh, we expect to get the compacting states to be more than 270 electoral college votes. So it could be 290 uh, and so on. So if one state 
were to withdraw, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Uh, and of course, the campaigns, the campaigns would be run as national campaigns. And the last thing uh, that a campaign wants is for the rules to change in the middle of the game. So, uh, it, so I, it's, there's provisions to protect it, and it's, it's unlikely to make a difference. Um, Bertrand, I was taken by your um, emphasis on making getting the poor to come out back in the olden urban days of Tammany Hall and all of the other machines. Um, the poor did vote and also got some kind of recompense mm -hmm. for doing such, which sort of brings together your two positions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, suge I I'm assuming that's not what you're suggesting at this yeah. point, and going back to machine politics, yeah. but how do you provide incentives to people who by definition have not received the benefits of political society? How do you make political si society relevant and yeah. beneficial to them. I mean, this is kind of an optimistic and maybe an idealistic account of how politics could, could work, but this is kind of my notion. If you give political parties the proper incentives to engage a wider swath of voters and particularly bring more poor, poor voters into their camp campaign calculus, what you ideally would see is a bit of a feedback loop. Campaigns would engage these particular individuals, and in their reaching out to these individuals, what they would quickly, quickly realize is that the typical scripted canvassing approach is probably not going to work for people that haven't voted in past elections. You're going to have a much more dialogic, um, um, there would have to be much more of a conversation of a back and forth a variety in which the individual that you're contacting are conveying a sense of where they are, how they're feeling, what their views are, what their senses are. That information is fed back to the campaign. That campaign um, maybe has a response for that individual right then. This is a policy that will be responsive to those particular needs, or maybe they don't. Just think about New Hampshire during the 2016 primaries, right? Um, you had um, Chris Christie who um, was banking on New Hampshire. He came in with his kind of you know, campaign platform that wasn't really focused on opioids at all. But then he went to ho homes in New Hampshire he talked to people. He got a sense of what people are experiencing there. And all of a sudden, op opioid addiction became a primary focal point of his particular campaign. So I imagine sort of a feedback operating in which you engage people that are non-participants in the, in the process. They provide a sense of what their needs are, right? That feeds back into the campaign. Campaign platforms adjust and modify. Campaigns re-engage these particular individuals. They put forth their proposals for responding to the problems that they're facing. And then that provides the encouragement or incentives for these people to vote to get that person into office. And then ideally once in office, there would be a responsibility that these um, um, candidates feel towards those individuals that they campaign to get their votes, knowing that once you make a person a voter, right, they could easily use their vote for the other side if they don't feel like you are satisfying um, your promises to them, or at least making an attempt to do so. So that's kind of how I imagine sort of a, it's an iterative process. It would probably be, you know, a long term, it won't happen in one election, but I think over the course of multiple elections and multiple mobilization activities and contacts with particular individuals, it could um, have that more inclusive incentivizing effect of it. So I just want to make a quick comment about Steve and, and the ads, um, anybody who has been in a battleground state knows that you're just um, overwhelmed by the ads. And for somebody coming from California who's not used to it, it's uh, particularly overwhelming. But anybody having watched the, uh, the championship series on both the National and the American League um, will have noticed that Trump's ads have been in coming across in all of these baseball games. So we've had at least a little bit of um, exposure to that. And since uh, there are at least two more games to go in the, well, I shouldn't say two more. There are potentially two more <laughs> games <laughs> to go in yeah. the um, <laughs> AL Championship Series that uh, you might see some more ads in that regard. So, uh, one of the criticisms of national popular vote, which Steve brought up, is uh, elections would become very expensive because uh, they're expensive as they are now when you're only campaigning in a couple of states. Imagine if you had to campaign in the entire country. 
uh, the truth is that campaigns cost exactly as much as the candidates can raise. Uh, not a dime more and not a dime less. Uh, the only question is where that money is spent. So right now, in the presidential campaign, all that money is dumped in Ohio and Florida and a couple other states and nothing comes to California. Under a national campaign, the Ohioans and the Floridans would have a few less ads and we in, in, in California and Wyoming and North Dakota would have a few more few ads. So it's not true that a national campaign would bankrupt the country. Uh, the, the campaigns would, again, try to raise as much as they can and uh, they would spend it evenly across the country. Steve, did you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, it strikes me that um, two, two points. One is there's a lot of unpredictability on these kinds of changes. And so I'll just give you one for instance. If, you, if we had, instead of the, the scheme that's proposed of the compact among the states, which may have constitutional problems, we'll leave that for another day. Um, if you'd had the Maine and Nebraska system in place for all 50 states in 2012, Mitt Romney would have won the Electoral College because he won more congressional districts across the country. So I don't think we're very happy with that, but that's something that's different from winner take all. Um, the other one is, is uh, 2012 is an interesting election because it's the first time a president has ever been reelected with a lower amount of popular vote than, than his initial election. That never happened before to a reelected president. And you talk about finding voters through canvassing. 2008 is really the first election in the era of social media and being able to target and identify voters. In 2012, the, the brilliance of the Obama campaign, if you've never saw it, I think it's probably still available online called Inside the Cave about their digital operation to identify voters. And you know, I have friends in Brooklyn who talked about how you know, it's a strongly democratic area, but they wanted to get every single vote out. And their micro-targeting was unbelievably sophisticated. So that took a lot of money. And yeah, I think you know, the TV ads are wasted. I'm not quite sure why they still do it, except the political consultants make coin off of that in their commissions. And there's a, it's kind of corrupt in a certain way. But I think that's going to happen bigger. And it obviously favors the incumbent, because they get an earlier start. They raise more money early. They get a, you know, um, and, and that's why uh, the Obama digital operation was so decisive to finding every, they, did, they left no votes on the table anywhere. They got them all. Um, and so go find inside the cave and look at that, and because that's our future. I think that's going to get more sophisticated. So uh, questions from the audience. Um, we're not using cards because I find cards to be stifling of speech. But please ask questions um, if you could. Um, there's a question here front. And please wait for the mic, because this is being videoed. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Churchill from uh, Lincoln Party. Uh, we are independents. And I come to a lot of these panels. And I never hear anyone speaking of how you're going to get the independents how to vote. By latest polls, they represent, because of our incivility, the divisions between the main parties becoming toxic. The independents today self-identify as close to 57% of the people eligible to vote. How are we going to get these people out to vote? My question. Thank you. Did everybody hear the question? Basically, how to get independents out to vote. And independents now represent a large portion of the population. So the question is how to get them to vote. So the way to get them out to vote is what California and other states do is they mail the ballot to every voter uh, three weeks before the election. So fill it out and mail it back. So I think that there's, I think that there's, a, what? I think that there's, um, um, in addition to kind of easing the voting, right, through mail in ballots and other forms, I think you have to also, and this kind of goes to Anthony Downs' idea that. You know, the likelihood of being a pivotal voter um, increases the sort of likelihood that you're going to vote, and it's going to increase sort of the um, degree of political activity by the parties and who they're reaching out to. So I think that the focus in partisan gerrymandering has been too much on proportionality or symmetry, trying to ensure that the 
um, delegation that the state is sending to Congress or the state legislature is, you know, the same proportion of members of the two parties in the in those two things with the voters on the ground. My my thought is that the real problem with gerrymandering is the construction of safe districts, and also you combine it with closed primary systems. And you combine those two things, and this kind of goes back to Steve's point in terms of this sort of, we've gotten more homogenized, harmonized parties and more polarized envir environments in which you clearly can differentiate between the two parties, and maybe we agree with that or not. But when you take out sort of the competitive impulse in terms of, of elections, that it creates an incentive to just kind of focus on your base, right? To flock towards your base. Um, and I think that in a competitive environment, that there, is, there are a lot more difficulties and a lot more um, problems with doing that, and you're more likely to lose elections. And therefore, you may sort of be more inclined to reach out to those independent voters, identify what their needs and wants are, see if you can incorporate that into your platform, see if you can encourage those individuals to vote. So in addition to making it easier to vote, I think just making um, elections more competitive could have an effect of encouraging more activity and engagement with independents. Just a quick, quick comment. Uh, you, most independents, I mean, less on California, so we're a little outlier in so many ways. Most independents tend to lean one way or another, but are just disgusted with politics. And one of the big question marks of a popular vote scheme, whether it's, it's a pure popular vote or whether it's linked in this proposal to the Electoral College, it's not clear whether it will encourage serious third party candidates, which is what a lot of independents say they would like. The Electoral College right now discourages third parties, and we still had two serious challenges in the last gener you know, two generations. So Wallace in 68, who wanted to use his votes to make a deal with the winner, uh, and Ross Perot in 92, he didn't win any states, but he certainly affected how it went. And so one of the unpredictabilities of whichever form of change we might decide to embrace is whether the third party, and whether we have a runoff like they do in France, are we gonna to go to France's system of a runoff between the top two? I can tell you a lot about the defects of that, uh, and, but I won't. Hi, question about the uh, popular vote. You know, with the finances of uh, each campaign being limited, don't we worry about that, you know, that the notion that each voter is gonna get the same amount of attention in a popular vote? that may not happen because they have limited finances and they're gonna just go by numbers and you're gonna just replace one set of discrepancies with another. I don't understand. If, if, they, have lim if they have certain finances, they're gonna focus on areas with a large population that they may oh, be able to large. turn around okay. rather than smaller rural areas yeah. where the numbers are not that important. Now, they're gonna, in, a, in a popular vote election, you're gonna focus on voters wherever, wherever they live. Uh, it's cheaper, actually, to reach voters in rural areas, so the bang for the buck is uh, much, much higher. Uh, but th they will, go everywhere where there are voters uh, because it's the number of votes that you, that you get wins. It's a, it's a myth that, it, that uh, everybody in the country lives in California or everybody in the country uh, lives in Los Angeles and, and New York. Uh, the, the, uh, the room's on a timer and so we have somebody uh -huh. dedicated to... <laughs> I mean, I, Manual override. Yeah, I mean, so. it'd be a tough class to teach in for sure. Yeah. Um, so, um, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to the national popular vote, but I, my concern is kind of something that you articulated is um, less sort of the fo focus on urban versus rural voters, but on poor versus, or people that have voted in past election versus people that have not voted in past elections. And there are correlations between voting in past elections and your income class, right? And so those that are more costly to mobilize in the sense that it requires more mobilization activity, more effort to get individuals to vote, um, are, if, they're, if funding is scarce, um, they're perhaps less likely to be targeted in a campaign. Um, so that's my concern. So I, I think that um, my idea would be to kind of match a national popular voting system with sort of the ideas that I've suggested in terms of some sort of mobilization matching fund. To the extent that you target areas that include a lot of non-voters, you get sort of funding from the federal government that is 
paid for by the tax checkoff thing that we do right now for presidential matching funds that are not used for anything anymore right now because no sane presidential candidate will actually take the matching funds. Um, you and, thank Obama for that. Yeah, you thank Obama yeah. for that, exactly. McCain, one of his great achievements right, from my point McCain was the last one to do it, and he <laughs> realized immediately that was the dumbest decision that he ever made. Um, <laughs> um, and so, but that, that would kind of have to be done to ensure that there is that sort of engagement with those individuals that I think need to be engaged. Um, because yet, you're right, there, there's, as, as Steve was saying, there's only campaign, can, elections only cost what campaigns can earn or could sort of secure from donations and what they can spend. Other questions over here? Um, so I guess one confusion that I have, and I'm hoping you can um, resolve it is when we talk about a national popular vote program, is that also talking about like nationalizing the election more like a German model? And then is, do, do you see potential for that? Because when you're talking about campaign finance, a lot of it is assuming that the same model would be necessary where effectively you have lobbyists and ads to essentially buy votes or sway things a certain way. But do you feel like there could be a different model where, um, the whole idea of campaign finance and like needing to essentially influence people's votes through ads and lobbying kind of goes away and we could have something where there is more debate or discussion or like some other mechanisms to explain what would actually happen and, and, and is there a way to kind of take campaign finance out of it and is there a potential for that in this kind of creating like a nationalized election? I'm probably too idealistic. <laughs> Oh, I'll give it a try. And by the way, I love idealism. And I always encourage it in students and citizens. Um, and so I'm sorry to say the blunt answer is no. <laughs> it's, it, you're not going to get the money out of it. I think it's going to get worse uh, for a lot of reasons that you know, critics on both left and right have pointed to. Is it Page and uh, is it Page and Gill? I forget the guys who have done the really good work about how it's the preferences of the wealthy that are winning in our political system these days. They're absolutely right. Not all those preferences are right-wing preferences, though. I mean, remember that Wall Street was heavily on the side of Hillary Clinton in the last campaign. And, um, uh, you, you know, my, I, I joke these days that I'm for a wealth tax because all these liberal Silicon Valley billionaires need to be punished for, okay. It's, you know, it's, uh, anyway, it's, uh, no, it's going to intensify that problem, and in part because if you're campaigning where most of the votes are and you want to get the most, you know, Trump wanted to get more votes from California, those are also the most expensive places to do that, whether it's ads or whether it's the canvassing and other operations. So it's going to intensify the pressure. And I think, uh, yeah, of course you're limited by how much you can raise. I don't think there's going to be any trouble getting the money to double the amount of spending on a presidential campaign. Um, that's just the world we live in now, sadly. I mean... Question here. Uh, Hold on, wait. Yes, thank you. Um, on the national popular vote, is the winner 50% or just whoever wins the most votes? And so then we get the possibility of a minority president and how are third parties going to factor into that? And are you looking towards maybe some kind of ranked voting system to kind of resolve that kind of situation? Uh, there's, there's so many different reforms that could be done. So with the national popular vote, as we're doing, it's the person who gets the most votes, period. Uh, we do have, you might say, minority presidents under the present system. Uh, Bill Clinton, for example, uh, got less than half the votes when he became president, although he was the national uh, popular vote uh, winner. Uh, so it's a majority of the, of, of the votes, a plurality. Uh, other types of reforms to have runoffs or campaign finance or ranked choice, those are other, other things. We're just trying to establish one simple thing. Candidates should campaign all over the country, and whoever gets the most votes should win. That's too big big improvements over the present system. And they're easily, it's easily doable as we're well along the way to getting that. We have the idea, my friend here, that possibly there could be like a common pot of money that taxes can be contributing toward political campaigns and the exact percentage of how much money gets contributed, that is beyond my 
thinking, but there'd just be like one big pot. You're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're an independent, you're whatever. It all goes in one big pot. And then all possible candidates can access the pot on an equitable basis. That way, if you're a person who your supporters don't have a whole bunch of money, no problem, because guess what? You are equally entitled under this proposed back row idea to equal access in the pot. Just thinking, I don't know if it's gonna work, but hey, we're just throwing this out there. It would create more equity. People who are poor would be better represented. And maybe because they have contributed through taxes, there would be more of a feeling of, hey, I paid for this thing. I should vote. So just putting it out there. So if, if, if every... I, I have one last question. How can we um, use innovation to take the money out of the campaigns? It's disgusting how much we spend on our campaigns. Yeah. I would, I mean, the European model. Yeah, I would say in terms of the public financing option that you presented on the back row is um, something that states are doing. Um, there are, however, First Amendment limits to what states can do. They can, um, you know, use a public financing system so long as it doesn't sort of discourage um, um, contributions or spending by particular candidates. Um, um, but the public financing system cannot shut off private contributions. The court has, and, and, and spending. And so the court has clearly said that the First Amendment um, gives heightened protection to, to spending, and it gives pretty strong protections to um, contributions, such that you can establish contribution limits, but you can't eliminate contributions altogether. And so that's gonna be sort of a challenge because we have a public financing system, again, the presidential fund, right, campaign fund, is a taxpayer-funded system that provides uh, presidential candidates with money if they sort of abide by certain rules, which limits how much they could, you know, spend ultimately. Um, but you don't have to, you're not, if you're, you can't be forced into that system. And you could always sort of opt out and you can always sort of supplement public financing with private financing. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty close to the system we had until 2008 with the check off on your income taxes for a fund and there were caps on how much you could spend. And Obama smashed that all up because he realized he could raise more money privately and spend whatever he wanted. And we, so that's, that's now gone. It's still on our tax form, so that's now gone. But the thought experiment you'd have to do and why we'd have to think about refinements here is, uh, uh, let's think about the last 48 hours. Uh, Hillary Clinton has tweeted that Tulsi Gabbard is a Russian asset and they're setting her up to run third party. So should she get an equal amount of money to run as a third party candidate? What about Jill Stein who got 1% in the last election, maybe beyond the margin of difference in Wisconsin? Are we gonna have eight candidates all running big well-funded campaigns? And then are we gonna elect a president with 22% of the vote? And that president will probably be Donald Trump. Just, I could go sort of think out and game these things out. Or we're going to have a runoff, which we've never done in this country before. And as I say, if you look at things like the runoff system, especially in France, I'm not sure. Oh, I'll just mention one thing. So Trump, you know, he oscillates between 36% approval ratings on a day when he tweets too much, which is almost every day, and 45% when people aren't paying attention. Emmanuel Macron, the winner of the runoff system in France, uh, a few months ago, his approval rating was 18%. So I'm not sure this kind of scheme with, you know, uh, I mean, we don't like to, I know everybody hates the two-party system, I totally get it, uh, but the multi-party system might actually uh, produce a circumstance in which more of the public is dissatisfied with our political circumstances. There are other questions? Over there in the back. Thank you. Is either party more motivated or more effective at mobilizing the voter turnout from the bottom quintile? It, that's, a, that's a great question. And this actually was part of an interesting backstory to the National Voter Registration Act, which is commonly known as the Motor Voter Law, in which um, the goal was to make registration materials more available to individuals by requiring that agencies, state agencies, like the DMVs in particular, provide individuals with registration materials. And the idea that it was that it was going to increase the registration of those that are not registered to vote. Um, it passed, but there was a lot of Democratic opposition to that. And the reason why there's Democratic opposition to that is because if you are a mayor of a city, you won with the electorate as it exists. And if you change the electorate by adding more voters, it creates uncertainty with respect to whether you're going to win the next election. And so part of the challenge has been with respect to um, encouraging 
campaigns to mobilize low-income voters is that they're uncertain of how they will vote. And so you have, um, you don't have that sense that, you know, with African American voters, they develop a loyalty to the Democratic Party after Lyndon Johnson's push for the Voting Rights Act. And so you know, the more you get African American voters to vote, the more you're likely to get them to vote Democratic. So that's kind of a, 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 a no-brainer for Democrats to try to mobilize. It's a no-brainer for Republicans to try to suppress them, right? But with respect to low-income voters, it's not as certain. And that lack of certainty does diminish the incentives for parties to engage these voters. And which is why you don't have political parties engaging in mobilization activities directed towards it's more expensive to mobilize them, but it's also the uncertainty factor that limits their willingness to mobilize them. So, yeah. So we just have a couple more minutes. I was wondering, giving each of you a chance to say your last piece, either directed at somebody or just on your own. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, Steve, I'll let you go first. Well, I'll start. Um, so the defects of the current circumstances are always easy to make out. It's always a little hard, as I've suggested, to anticipate what changes might come. I think there's two things to think about. One is, uh, yeah, it's correct that for 16 years, for four election cycles, you had really two key battleground states, Florida and Ohio. But that's not carved in stone forever. And who thought Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and uh, uh, Michigan would become swing states? The maps change over time. It was only 30 years ago that California was still a reliably solid Republican state in presidential elections until President Clinton flipped it and flipped it hard. President Clinton also won uh, Louisiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, a lot of Missouri, a lot of states you now consider these deep, unchangeable red states. I can remember when Democrats used to elect liberal senators in states like oh, Idaho with Frank Church. Uh, and so maybe the two parties become switch places again. I think you don't want to assume that things are always carved in stone. Uh, and the other thing I'd say about a popular vote, this is what worries me about a big giant country like this is, the Florida thing was a total disaster, but the Electoral College confined that to one state. By the way, there have been two other elections, uh, 76, uh, uh, Carter and Ford, a shift of 12,000 votes in Ohio and Hawaii would have given Ford the electoral majority. And I think in 1916, I forget the number, but it's like 8,000 votes in California would have given the Electoral College to uh, the sub, who was the candidate Republican, the Supreme Court Justice, never mind. Um, think about the 1960 election, where you know, it's thought that you know, they stole some votes in Illinois and that secured the election for Kennedy. That election was 100,000 votes. We learned later, President Eisenhower wanted Nixon to challenge the result. He thought this would be bad. Now imagine doing a nationwide recount of a close election like that. By the way, the interesting historical thing, it's not really clear Kennedy got those votes, not from uh, Illinois. There's some irregularities of the ballots and counts in Alabama and Mississippi that nobody knows about. We don't know who got the most votes actually cast in that election. So, you know, we have a razor of close vote like that. Let's take what happened in Florida in 2000 and let's do that in every state. Won't that be a fun day? So I guess I'll, I guess I'll, I guess, I guess I'll close by um, saying that political inequality, and just to identify the links between political inequality and economic inequality, democracy is supposed to act as a check on economic inequality. Because at a certain point of extreme economic inequality, the median voter in terms of income is going to have an income below the mean. And so they should demand redistribution from their representatives. That's not happening. And why is it not happening? Because we don't have a particularly inclusive democracy. And the lack of inclusivity of democracy shifts the positioning of the median voter at the cost of fewer checks on rising economic inequality. And if you want to sort of think about what are the major sort of problems in our society right now um, is that rising economic inequality. And so in terms of kind of in innovations to increase participatory opportunities for the poor, whether it be a national um, popular vote, whether it be sort of a voucher system, whether it be a, a mobilization matching fund, I, I think that we need to sort of think about these innovations. But taking Steve's point seriously, we may want to think about them in smaller laboratories see it, how it operates in particular cities, see how it operates in particular states, see if it's gonna have the effects that we want it to have, and then try to think about nationalizing out the pro that project that is particularly successful. But we have to start that innovation now, and I think it's important to do so if we wanna have any um, chance of protecting the republic that we imagine that we live in. So I think we run every single election 
in this country under the principle that whoever gets the most votes should win, except one, the presidency. Makes no sense when we go around the world and try to institute democracy, like in Iraq. Do we say, you need an electoral college system? <laughs> no. We say, whoever gets the most votes uh, should win. And the candidates should go after voters everywhere, wherever they live. The present system that we have now is they go after the voters of the three or four battleground states, and the rest of us just sit around and wonder what those people are going to do. We're going to get stuck with it, whether it's uh, good, or, good or bad. So it's time to change the system. It's very doable uh, so that the president is the person who gets the most votes, the candidates campaign all over the country. About time. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists. I'd like to thank the audience. We were very happy you came. And if you want more information about the Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement, there's information outside as well. Thank you all, and go Bears. Thank you.